हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर रामाश्रय प्रसाद फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जियोग्राफी ऑफ डॉक्टर भीमराव अंबेडकर कॉलेज यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली डेली टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू डिस्कस जनरल एटमोसफियरिक सर्कुलेशन वर्टिकल एंड हॉरिजेंटल विच कम्स अंडर द पेपर क्लाइमेटोलॉजी फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट एस डिस्कस वॉट कूड बी द लर्निंग आउटकम ऑफ दिस मॉड्यूल वाइल गोइंग थ्रू दिस मॉड्यूल यू विल बी एबल टू डिफाइन जनरल एटमोसफियरिक सर्कुलेशन इन लिस्ट फैक्टर्स अफेक्टिंग एटमोसफियरिक सर्कुलेशन एक्सप्लेन डिफरेंट स्केल्स ऑफ एटमोसफियरिक सर्कुलेशन डिस्क्राइब सिंगल सेल एंड थ्री सेल एटमोसफियरिक सर्कुलेशन explain the mechanism of hadley cell feral cell and polar cell discuss the vertical atmospheric movement and describe the regional atmospheric circulation such as walker circulation now let us start with the introduction you very well know that atmosphere is composed of a variety of gases aerosols and water in all the three states therefore it has mass the mass of air is not at all static for all times but it is dynamic you must have observed blowing winds seen the plants leaves of or thin twigs of the tree or crops in the field blowing to one direction and coming back have you ever thought of this event as to why all happens it is the law of nature nothing happens out of nothing events or something happens due to some reasons this natural law also prevails with the movement of air generally the horizontal motion of air is represented by winds and vertical motion of the air by currents now let us talk about the atmospheric circulation as stated above there has to be some reasons for something to happen the first law of motion as explained by newton is concerned with inertia it states that an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force from this first law of motion it is quite obvious that any mass would be at its original motion until and unless some force is applied from outside it is also noteworthy that the acceleration or velocity would be determined by the quantum of force applied and the mass of the object to be accelerated now coming to the factors affecting atmospheric circulation let us talk about atmospheric pressure gradient pressure gradient is the change in the air pressure per unit of distance traveled along a certain line in another words it is an average change in barometric pressure per unit of distance along a certain linear direction in a given region pressure gradient can be calculated by the change in the isobaric values that is bar barometric pressure generally we calculate in millibar and it has to be seen in terms of the distance which we generally see it in kilometer for example suppose the two places x and y are 100 km away from one another at x suppose the air pressure is 1020 millibar and at y it is 1010 millibar therefore the pressure gradient can be calculated by dividing 
10 and 10 is the difference between 1020 millibar and 1010 millibar by 100 kilometer. This 100 kilometer is the total distance between the two places x and y. It gives a value of 0.1 millibar per kilometer. Take another example. When at A the air pressure is 1020 millibar and at Y it is 980 millibar. Get the difference between 1020 millibar and 980 millibar. It comes to 40 millibar. Divide it by 100 kilometer and 100 kilometer is the distance between the two places. The result would be 0.4 millibar per kilometer. Out of these two examples, the second one is 4 times greater than the first one. Hence, the wind speed would be 4 times more in comparison to the first case. Now, let us discuss about the Coriolis force. Coriolis practically speaking is not a force, but it is an effect which is observed on a mass of body of a rotating system. It results from the rotational movement of the earth and the movement of air in relation to the earth. It acts perpendicular to the axis of the earth. It is determined by the mass of the body and its rate of rotation. The earth rotates from west to east on its axis. Hence, the Coriolis force operates in north-south direction. The Coriolis force is 0 at the equator and maximum at the poles. The concept was first explained by French engineer G. G. Coriolis in 1835. Thus, it is known by his name. The earth is rotating on its axis. Equator has the maximum bulge. One rotation takes about 24 hours. The velocity of the rotation of the earth is 1670 kilometer per hour. It is the circumference which is about 40 kilometer along the equator which comes down to half that is 835 kilometer per hour along 60 degree north and south latitudes. Since the pole is a point and it does not have any circumference, the rotational velocity at pole is 0. The Coriolis effect does not affect the wind speed, but affects the direction, but the wind speed definitely affects the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is stronger when the moving air mass is huge and have greater velocity. Therefore, the greater velocity wind is deflected more in comparison to the less strong. All the three lines representing different velocity of the wind are merged together at equator. The violet line shows the wind speed of 5 meter per second that is 18 kilometer per hour while the red line shows 20 meter per second it comes to 72 kilometer per hour. It is obvious that the difference among these lines are great at the poles. The highest velocity is associated with highest Coriolis force. Now, coming to the frictional force, in simple term air friction is the resistance to motion of air in relation to the surface roughness and irregularity through which the wind is blowing. Frictional force reduces the velocity of the wind near the ground. Therefore, wind is most affected by the friction 
and it is maximum near the ground. As long as we keep on going above the ground, the friction is reduced very drastically. The surface irregularity and undulation is impacted by the blowing winds. Within a height of about 1 kilometer from the ground, the wind is creating eddies and a straight blow is heavily affected. After that, the velocity is increasing right moving arrows shows the direction as well as the velocity of the winds. Bigger arrow shows the greater speed, the smaller one indicate lesser velocity. On the land surface, the friction is greater, but on the sea surface due to uniformity, it is less. Now, coming to the centripetal force. Centripetal force operates at right angle to the blowing wind. It is the inward pulling force that is towards the center of the rotation. You must be very well aware that what the centripetal force is. Suppose you fix a ball with a, a string and you rotate by holding the other side of the string. The resultant force forces are centripetal and centrifugal. Generally, the winds are blowing in a curved path. The curvature is still more when the isobaric circular patterns are developed around high pressure or low pressure that is anticyclone and cyclone. It is very well developed above the friction layer vertically above about a height of around 5.5 kilometer the air pressure is approximately 500 millibar. By this height the friction force is almost terminated except over the highlands and mountains. The winds above the friction layer blow in a circular manner. Since the friction is over in case of low pressure Coriolis force is equal to centripetal force, but in case of high pressure where anticyclone is developed in upper troposphere pressure gradient force is equal to Coriolis force plus centripetal force. In these conditions the winds are blowing parallel to the isobars. It is called geostrophic winds by which the jet stream is developed about which you would study in another module. Now coming to the scales of atmospheric circulation. The atmospheric circulation happens at a varied scales of operation starting from a very small local scale to the global one. The circulation is classified on the basis of a spatial extension as well as its temporal duration. The planetary scale, atmospheric as well as oceanic circulation are redistributing the thermal energy on the earth's surface and atmosphere. The atmospheric circulation varies from one year to another, but the large scale pattern remains almost alike. The synoptic scale movements like frontal development, cyclones etc. have a certain duration of occurrence, but not very dis definitely pinpointed one. Their variations are sometimes randomly associated with certain conditional fulfillment. That variation might be of hundreds of kilometer. They develop in a, a specific belt in both the hemispheres. The atmospheric circulation at micro and meso scales have been discussed in module 12 concerning periodic and local winds. Synoptic scales of circulation is taken care in various modules 
related to air masses and cyclones, monsoons, atmosphere, ocean interaction, etc. In this module, planetary scale circulation is discussed below. Now, let us discuss about the planetary atmospheric circulation. At the planetary scale, the atmospheric circulation is divided into two groups. They are single cell atmospheric circulation model and three cell atmospheric circulation model. Now, coming to the single cell atmospheric circulation model, the term cell refers to the cycling of the air. Here, we are calling it a single cell. It means that it is operating at a global scale, but divided at the equator. Hence, in both the hemisphere, one cell is found. It, its occurrence is now debatable. The single cell atmospheric circulation model was proposed by George Hadley in 1735. At that time, a scanty information was available about the atmospheric science. Based on the personal experience about more heat in the equatorial belt and very cold polar region, he proposed that the air in the equatorial region is expanded due to more temperature. In expanded air, the air molecules are widely spaced. Therefore, the density is reduced. Reduction in density causes the air to be lighter. Lighter air gets uplifted and moves aloft with upper limit at tropospause. By that height, it comes very cool. Since there is continuously uprising air is, is existing, the uplifted air is being pushed towards north and south in both the hemispheres. Both the poles are very cold. Hence, the air over the poles is very dense and heavier. This leads to create high pressure belts surrounding the poles. According to this concept, cold air sinks at the poles and warm and heated air rises at equator. It results into the formation of Hadley cell, which is named after its inventor. Question is, is single cell model in operation? George Hadley proposed the single cell model, but it would develop only when the sun is overhead at equator and the earth is static, which is not the reality. While proposing this model, he did not consider other factors like apparent shift of the sun's position in an annual cycle. Earth's rotation and Coriolis effect were also not taken into account by Hadley. The distribution of land and water also play a very significant role in the heat transfer, heating of the surface and the air in their contact. Therefore, the idea of single cell was well accepted long time back, but now the researches have proved that the single cell is not in operation, rather it is a three cell, three cell atmospheric circulation. Now coming to the three cell atmospheric circulation model. By now, you must have read about the planetary pressure belts and winds in module 10. The distribution of pressure belts and winds is fairly well established and their seasonal variations are also well known. The pressure belts are result of interplay of various factors. The pressure variations give genesis to horizontal motion of the air that is wind. It is well known fact that the maximum sun energy is received 
in the equatorial region and this energy is redistributed by the winds and ocean currents as mentioned earlier also. But this energy redistribution is not directly from the high energy zone to the low energy zone in a single cell. This redistribution is performed through well developed distinct three cells. Three cell formation and their relative regulation is in a sequential manner. These cells divide the troposphere into three separate distinct and almost closed atmospheric circulation. The three cells are tropical cell, mid latitude cell and polar cell. Now, coming to the tropical cell. Tropical cell exists between equator and 30 degree north and south latitudes. It is thermally induced cell. The upper limit of the cell is determined by the tropopause. First of all, it was explained by George Hadley in 1735 and so it is named after his name. Now, mechanism of this cell. The maximum heat is received in equatorial region. Due to high heat, the air expands and it becomes light and rises up. This ascending air cools gradually and starts descending down over around 30 degree north and south latitudes due to rotation of the earth. This descending cool and dense air increases atmospheric pressure in these belts which are also known as horse latitudes. The winds blow from the subtropical high pressure belts to equatorial low pressure belt as trade winds and complete circulation develops in the tropics of both the hemispheres. It is termed as Hadley cell. It has three distinct characteristics. The Hadley cell exists throughout the year and is always in operation with slight north and southward shifting depending upon the seasons. The upper air movement poleward conserves its axial angular momentum, but the equatorward moving air faces surface friction and finally loses velocity. The balance is achieved between warm upward moving air and the wind converging at the intertropical convergence zone. The rising air in the equatorial region helps in developing cumulonimbus clouds to extensive height. After condensation and precipitation, great amount of latent heat is released there and it gives impetus to drive tropical Hadley cell equatorward. The direction of the movement of air in the upper troposphere is from southwest to northeast in northern hemisphere. At the ground level or near the surface, the general direction of wind is from northeast to southwest as trade winds of northern hemisphere bearing the seasonal changes. The air movement at upper troposphere and ground level is opposed to each other of which the reason is very well explained in module 10. In general, the principle is that whatever is wind blowing direction there at a ground its direction aloft is reverses. Now, talking about the intertropical convergence zone, the trade winds coming from subtropical high from both hemisphere converges near equator during equinox. It is this zone from where the air rises and it is generally termed as doldrums. It is a zone of almost no horizontal air movement. With the changing seasons, the departure in the Hadley cell and ITCZ that is intertropical convergence zone 
is also absorbed. Now coming to the mid latitude cell, mid latitude cell exists between 30 to 60 degree north and south latitudes. It is found between Headley cell and polar cell. It is developed due to dynamic conditions prevailing between the two cells bordering it. The cell is operating just reverse to tropical cell. First of all, it was explained by William Farrell in 1856 and so it is named after him. Now, let us talk about its mechanism. The low pressure around equator is thermally induced. The high pressure at subtropical zone is dynamically created by subsiding air from above coming from the intertropical convergence zone. From this high pressure, winds are blowing in both the directions towards equator and towards poles, but before reaching the poles another low pressure is bound to develop and it appears at around 60 degree north and south latitudes. It happens so because the pole is excessively cold, it is quite natural to be a high pressure around poles. Therefore, two high pressure that is subtropical and polar, the low pressure development is quite oblivious. At this low pressure belt, rising air reaches near the tropopause and gets diverted towards pole as well as subtropical direction. Hence, cell created by the circular motion from subtropical high to subpolar low again upward diverted to subtropical high and finally sinking is known as feral cell. The mid latitude cell or feral cell is also termed as polar front cell. You might be knowing that in the higher latitudes the temperature contrast is greater. Polar areas are occupied by cold air mass while on the southern side warm air mass develops. When both the air masses come closer and interacts with each other, the fronts are created. At the ground surface or near the surface, the winds are blowing from southwest to northeast. Generally, these are known as westerlies, but a loft air circulation it is opposite to it. Now coming to polar cell. The polar cell develop between 60 degree and poles in both the hemispheres. Pol polar areas are thermally induced. High pressure belts as it is developed because of the excessively cold conditions. Temperature is very low, air is dry, intermolecular space of air is very less and hence the density is very high. This air has the tendency to lay near surface along the surface cold winds blow towards the subpolar low as sterly. From subpolar low it is lifted up to convergence with the westerly at polar fronts. From near the tropopause it is diverted towards pole and finally completes a circulation called polar cell. In brief the three cell atmospheric circulation model is symmetrical in shape and character with the seasonal asymmetrical appearance. The best symmetry is during equinox and the maximum asymmetry is during solstice. Now coming to the vertical atmospheric circulation. Earth has a strong gravitational pull as we all know very well. 
in spite of gravitation pull the question arises as to what causes the air to rise and what happens when the air moves upward. To get the answer of these two questions you must have got some idea from the discussion above about different atmospheric cells. You have studied that the condensation and precipitation release latent heat and it generates additional energy to boost the diversion process from equatorial zone. You would study about the condensation and precipitation in module 17 to 19. Most of the condensation and precipitation processes are related to the vertical atmospheric circulation. Under above mentioned conditions, the upward moving air mass is bound to get altered and modified. The modification is seen in terms of air temperature, density and pressure. Most of the time, if moisture is available, condensation and precipitation are natural outcomes. You would study about the forms and types of precipitation in module 19 in detail, but in brief here uplifting or vertical motion in the air is caused by convective lifting, orographic lifting, uh, frontal or cyclonic lifting and convergent lifting. In all these four cases rising of the air cools, relative humidity increases, water holding capacity of the mass of the air reduces, dew level reaches by cooling of the air. In the presence of hygroscopic nuclei, water vapor turns into tiny droplets through collusion and coalescence process the water droplets become bigger and fall down in numerous forms of precipitation. In other words, the vertical motion in the air causes cooling of the rising air as well as precipitation. Coming to regional vertical atmospheric circulation, apart from the above mentioned vertical motion of the air, some other vertical circulations also occur at regional level, but they are not confined to an annual cycle. Their development is related to the regional synoptic changes. They are mainly Walker circulation, Southern oscillation and El Nino, Southern oscillation and La Nina. Now coming to the Walker circulation. The concept of Walker circulation was proposed by Sir Gilbert Walker. It is based on the difference in surface pressure and temperature over tropical western and eastern Pacific Ocean. Normally, tropical western Pacific is warm and humid with low pressure. Opposite to it, the tropical eastern Pacific is cool and dry with high pressure over the area. Therefore, in western part warm and humid air rises and give rain and aloft it goes to eastern pacific and sink there and enhances the high pressure. This is the normal affair associated with general weather conditions. Now coming to the southern oscillation and El Nino. This normal condition reverses after few years and it is termed as El Nino and Southern Oscillation. In this case, Walker circulation weakens and warm air is spread to the Eastern Pacific where low pressure develops. Warm and moist air rises, gives rain there and diverges towards west and subsides in western pacific. It is completely opposite to walker circulation 
and it is termed as El Nino. Now coming to the southern oscillation and La Nina. When the western Pacific is increasingly warm and humid and the low pressure is intense, it is called La Nina. La Nina is opposite to El Nino, keeping the water circulation in the center. Both of these conditions are the two extremes of the events. All these are affecting the larger regional weather. These are also included in the vertical motion of the atmosphere. You will study about them in detail in module 15 on ocean atmosphere interaction. Now let us conclude this module. A huge envelope of air is surrounding the earth. It is made up of several gases, minute solid substances, a smoke and water vapor. The atmospheric circulation is governed primarily by four forces. The first one is pressure gradient which is the change in the difference of isobar per unit distance along a line. This line may be horizontal or vertical. Horizontal pressure gradient is gentle while the vertical pressure gradient is much steep. The in spite of a steep pressure gradient in vertical case, the wind is not that strong as gravitation of the earth pulls everything centerward. The second is Coriolis force which is the effect of rotation of earth on the moving air or wind. In northern hemisphere, the wind is deflected to the right direction from its designated direction. Centripetal force is the third one which is resultant of the curvature of the air blowing. It is most deflected when the wind velocity is more, but it is less when the velocity is less. The third is the friction of the earth which is the function of the irregularity and undulation of the earth surface. Generally the friction is negligible above 5.5 kilometer height bearing the highlands and mountains. It is quite natural that the acceleration is more when the applied force increases. The scales of the atmospheric circulation is very wide. It starts with the appearance of a small turbulence or it is at the local level lasting for a few minutes to the global scale like planetary system of wind circulation. In between lies the meso scale and synoptic scales. Large scale phenomena are more reliable, predictive and have major patterns almost in symmetrical manner with the pivotal point along the equator. The decrease in the scale leads to less pre-designed prediction and more variation in the pattern. Therefore, at the smallest scale it completely seems to be random. The planetary atmospheric circulation can very well be explained by three cells in each hemisphere. They are tropical or headly cell, feral or temperate cell and polar cell. Tropical or headly cell explains the converging air along ITCJ rises up. Condensation and precipitation leads to release of latent heat and it gives impetus to the convective cell and further divergence from the upper tropospheric level. The diverged air sinks around subtropical high. The second cell develops between 30 degree to 60 degree north and south latitudes. It is known as feral cell. The polar cell is formed between 
60 degree north and south to poles. Vertical motion in the air is associated with the lifting of the air. It is performed in four ways. They are convective, orographic, frontal and convergent. Thank you. Thank you very much.